And then I've got a couple uh, videos queued up too. So, uh, some of this opening part we talked about uh, yesterday, I got you that handout so you can jot down some notes. So scope versus scale, have that off the top of your head. Scope means what? Scale means what? Scope's diversification scale is increasing by the same way. Okay, so yeah, both have in common the idea of driving down longer on average cost. Um, sometimes some books don't drive that home, but it's, it's really meant to be long run cost. Let me pick your principal's brains a little deeper. What was the distinction that's important to realize between long run and short run cost? Hold on, let me go to somebody else. But thank you, but I just, you, you got in on the last one, so. Over Yes, there you go, <laughs> the other one. So all costs can vary in the long run. And that's uh, important to keep in mind of why it's long run costs so that we can uh, double everything, double the amount of equipment, double the real estate, double anything, right, um, is, is the long run distinction. So um, both of those deal with long run if we uh, increase the scope of our production or the scale. <coughs> So conflicts of interest can substantially reduce the quality of information in financial markets. How? Why does a conflict of interest potentially reduce the quality of information? Let me go to somebody else besides Michael and John. Mm. Kate. Okay. So uh, conflict of interest, the person Okay, good. Yeah. So when just by kind of the nature of it is as we're biasing something because we it's going to work better for our firm or, or me personally. And so by its nature, there's asymmetric information. Right. So we're not letting out all of the information um, to the people involved so that the quality is less. It's, 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 a, it's going to be biased. All right, so um, types of conflicts. Let you kind of, we'll kind of cruise through some of these. I thought it was interesting on uh, universal banking. What was the name of the act that separated securities operations from banking in the United States? The Glass-Steagall Act, right? Uh, but in other countries, they've, they've always kept those together. And um, pretty strong economies, too, I thought was, was kind of interesting. So it's not because, um, and, and Switzerland is one that's higher in the Economic Freedom Index even. So um, I thought it was interesting to look at the, the countries that um, didn't think much about separating those two. So. <coughs> What was spinning? Somebody other than Kate, Michael, John? We talked about that on Monday. Austin. Spinning it, Austin? You weren't what here, Austin? but. You're out here a piece of paper. <laughs> what was spinning? Adam, did you look over on John's paper? Yeah, there you go. Spinning occurs when investment banks allocate off the enterprise. Okay, yeah. so that was. Uh, kind of the cronyism going on to some degree of, hey, I've got a, I've got a favorable customer that's a good customer of mine. I'm going to get that person kind of privileged first dibs on the hot IPO. Hopefully that they'll come back. So it's kind of, kind of was a way of, of getting a, a kickback. Yeah, so accounting, you know, we take those auditors out for a nice dinner, okay, give them some lobster and a couple drinks, hopefully they'll, they'll treat us well with our third party audit. It is kind of strange when you have those. Um, so 
in, in the real estate business I was with, we'd have third party audits come in and it was usually the same accounting firm that would come in and it was required by the bank. We had one particular property, I wasn't an owner of this one, but it was a pretty large uh, development where the bank was participating in equity on the project. And so each year they would send in their accounting firm to do an audit of our books. And so it was kind of a once a year thing. And I remember Ev Sr., my mentor, you know, always kind of chumming up, everything's going okay, right? And, you know, I don't know, just kind of playing, playing nice with them. Uh, not that there was anything devious, but it's just kind of a natural, natural thing to do. So we got, we've talked about the credit rating, how that can work to their favor. Just kind of breezing through some of these, feel free to stop if you see something that catches your eye. Is it made by limited losses by selling to customers or selling to customers? Like, I'm assuming it's how it operates. So this is with the universal banking um, with, uh, so you have a banking client and somebody who's participating in the, stock mar in the stock market and you're their broker too. And so a limit loss would be after, if this stock tanks to a certain amount, then pull it out and sell it. And it could kind of be on, on autopilot that way. So I think the most notable thing here is the empirical evidence. So in general, they haven't found that they've been doing that with the research that economists and financial um, finance people have done, uh, that that hasn't happened too much. Of course, there's always some at the margins, but in general, is it a widespread epidemic or not? The empirical evidence doesn't seem to suggest that. And um, same thing with um, overall conflicts of interest with, um, with these uh, areas being mixed together. So that bodes well to potentially a market solution being out there if it's not some sort of widespread epi epidemic that would cause the, the government to have to be hard and fast. So this last statement, reputational rents. So what is rent seeking in economics? Generically, again, back to principles class, the idea of rent seeking. Was it the above and beyond the traditional price or something? Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of that surplus, that extra um, uh, bonus that might be kind of unearned in a sense. So um, if we go out and look for uh, political favors or subsidies for an activity that we really don't need the money anywhere, then we call that rent seeking. And, and, and so economists in general uh, think that that uh, is, is a wasteful activity and we should try to be uh, reduced. Here, the context is a little bit different. Individuals might be able to capture reputational rents off of the company that they're working for. So <clears throat> with this, um, I go to work for, um, well, we, we talked about, uh, what was his name, Quattron uh, for Swiss Boston Bank. And so he goes to work for there. Hi, I'm an agent of State Farm. Hi, I'm an agent of Swiss Boston. You know us. We're the big, really big Wall Street company, right? So you kind of have this, uh, what's also referred to as a halo effect, where you get, an, you get this kind of... Uh, extra additional thing whether it's deserved or not if you're a, a lousy no good person who's out to rip people off the fact that you work for that company you kind of brings credibility along with it and might allow you to be a little devious in the short run and capture some money capture some rents so reputational rents
Okay, so here we go to the regulations on the books. So we're going to look at three of them, and two out of the three we're going to have a couple videos associated with. So Sarbanes-Oxley was put into place. Here's the bullet points cut out of the textbook. And then I'm going to run a short video that kind of gives us an overview so you guys can take some notes with the, the way we've got the PowerPoint today. In late 2001, people began to notice some accounting irregularities with a large publicly traded company. The company had a national reputation for consistency in both good times and bad, so it was considered a blue chip stock. The name of this company was Enron. Within weeks, the stock went from over $90 a share to being nearly worthless. This occurred because the management team tried to cover up losses from the previous years by altering their financial statements. The deception that occurred gave the public a reality check, and in effect, investors started taking a look into the financial records of other large corporations. Sarbanes-Oxley Act was introduced into Congress by U.S. Senator Paul Sarbanes of Maryland and U.S. Representative Michael Oxley of Ohio. Oh, that's great. Their intention was to create a law which would restore the faith of investors back into corporate America by imposing stricter standards on financial reporting. There would be an increase in the reliability of the financial statements created by any given company. Let's take a deeper look at what the Sarbanes-Oxley Act includes. First, officers of the company are required to sign financial statements for accuracy. This holds them personally accountable for any misrepresented data. Second, an increased fine and or prison sentence was set for individuals who attempt to defraud investors or misrepresent actual figures. Third, the company must provide a description of its internal controls. This is an attempt to increase the confidence of the public in that organization while allowing them to gain an insight into the company's procedures. Fourth, the company is responsible for hiring an independent accounting firm to come in and audit the accuracy of their financial reports. The financial reports are now required to have a section dedicated to the auditor's opinion as to the accuracy of the figures presented in the reports. Fifth, the company is now mandated to report all off-balance sheet transactions on the reports. Finally, the Securities and Exchange Commission is given more power to look into companies that are suspected of wrongdoing. The SEC will now do random reviews of companies to ensure that they are complying with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. The reports are then published and released to the public review. The SEC has a special division that is designated to work with Sarbanes-Oxley issues. This division is called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board.
figure of to educate you in the Lord and serve in Oh, it did. Drawbacks. It seems like I feel really nice and protected. possible that it's not enough. Other thoughts on drawbacks to that type of legislation? I mean, one of the pieces that again are kind of couched up we've had some um, papers over regulation, like over regulation, deregulation, things like that. I mean I, overall it provides an added cost to Okay. Um, and granted, yes, it's not that much in some larger companies, but for example the ones that are Right, so it kind of hurts the smaller companies potentially a lot, which might then have negative effects on what? Competition, competition right? So it would reduce competition. It would reduce entry of new firms possibly, right? New innovation. So those are, those are some of the unintended consequences of, uh, that could be going on. So I got this little thing here. This is a, a little new Gin Gingrich. Many Americans are worried about the economy and wonder if these steps taken to get the economy moving again. This year, Congress has allocated $1 trillion to get the economy moving, and yet all this spending has only slowed the rate of decline. It is clear that Congress has to come up with new strategies and approaches to grow the economy once again. There is one step Congress should take immediately, which would liberate American businesses, create jobs, and provide opportunities for new startups and not cost the taxpayer a penny. The Congress should repeal Sarbanes-Oxley, which costs every small business $4,360,000 a year in compliance if it wants to become a public company. $4,360,000 a year is massively bigger than the original Securities Exchange Commission estimate that it would cost $91,000 a year for compliance. The government estimate was wrong by a factor of 4,000 percent. This bad. difference in cost can be a matter of life and death for small businesses. One California venture capital firm told me that Sarbanes-Oxley has pushed new businesses back from a five-year startup period to a 12-year startup period. This costs money and jobs, and it discourages future entrepreneurs from starting their own businesses. America's great strength has always been inventing the next generation of new companies and new jobs. America has always focused on growing the future rather than propping up the past. Now Sarbanes-Oxley is destroying new job creation and new company growth at a time when we need it the most. The effect of Sarbanes-Oxley in Silicon Valley has been especially dramatic. In the second quarter of 2008, there were no public offerings of venture capital-backed companies in Silicon Valley a phenomenon not seen since 1978. In the third quarter, there was only one. Sarbanes-Oxley has had a direct effect on venture capital. If it is not repealed, we will see Silicon Valley's status as a hotbed of innovation erode, and see more and more of our future invented outside of the United States. Alex Pollack, a distinguished scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, has concluded that the total cost far outweighed the benefits, especially for smaller companies. Mr. Pollock is not alone. Roberta Romano of Yale has concluded that Congress pieced together a series of reforms, resulting in provisions that were ill-conceived. In fact, Ms. Romano is so unhappy with Sarbanes-Oxley 
and she recommends that the corporate governance provisions should be stripped of their mandatory force and rendered optional for registrants. The experts have condemned the cost of Sarbanes-Oxley. Business leaders, entrepreneurs, and venture capital investors have all condemned the cost of Sarbanes-Oxley. The time has come to create more American jobs and grow more American companies by repealing Sarbanes-Oxley. If you agree that Congress should act now to help the economy by repealing Sarbanes-Oxley, go to americansolutions.com and sign our petition to Congress to help create jobs and repeal this bill. Remember, the economy you are saving is yours. So, if you're a big <laughs> existing, <laughs> if you are an existing big company, do you support Sarbanes-Oxley? Yes. Yeah. This goes on with all kinds of regulation. This is this is the cronyism part, where people are like. They know that that's a good law because it protects them from entry and competition of other firms. So you will see big companies supporting that legislation and keeping it alive and padding the pockets of other politicians that will support to keep it alive. That's, that's what goes on with, and they're just looking out for their own self-interest, God bless them, right? So I'm not going to, I'm not gonna throw them completely under the bus but we need rules in place that just don't allow it, that don't allow that to happen, in my opinion. So, so because we have to support, I, I think if, if the data, which is, you know, I'm not gonna go by Newt's comments here strictly, but, but if the data supports that it's even close to that $4 million figure for starting up, up and then when they originally thought it was gonna be a $91,000 figure, if it's even close to that, I don't think you need to be an economist to figure out that that's a pretty big barrier to entry, right? Which is one of the things that inhibits competition. So you're saying that we need to basically have a law to I yeah, I I think a lot of that I would I would be I, up for. I mean, to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't I don't have a, a great answer, but I think there, there's way too much of that in in the United States. Yeah. All right. So there's a couple countering arguments, and you can see how nice the political um, play is for um, that first video that we saw where, where we've got the greedy Wall Street, you know, the whole story, you leave that video thinking, oh yeah, that's a good law, right? But you don't think about these other unintended consequences that how that might um, play out in the long run. And, and hopefully that's what we got some bright econ undergrads like yourselves uh, working on the rest of your life to help change the world. Okay, so here's our second act, uh, Global Legal Settlement Act of 2002. Got rid of that spinning, more fines. It was global, so they were trying to get, uh, get things farther reaching around the globe. can't be as as overt about it yeah I mean I, I think I think anybody's they're, they're going to but but like with again out. and to the I guess to the point of government regulation with a high enough fine they're gonna say that's not worth it right so I mean if, if depending on what the the fine is as Kate was saying if the if the fine is a million dollars to somebody who's making 10 billion a year then then, maybe, then, then it still does go on do their own little cost benefit analysis, right? I, I guess I don't see how it's going to be. You know, I can see how you can ban it, but at the same time, it seems like it'd be something that'd be very hard to get a conviction yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they have to have, you know, recorded conversations, emails, you know, the whole thing of, of the monitoring issues that you face for that. I just, I guess I, I see it being a very easy law to get around if you yeah. want to. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you got a couple couple friends at lunch at uh, at the swanky place on, on Wall Street 
Okay, so then uh, Dodd-Frank comes along in 2010. So this is the most recent contentious bill that, that's out there. And a lot of Dodd-Frank was in response to the residential mortgage uh, market. provisions 
that there, in fact, will not be any law that is really Dodd-Frank. That whatever you think Dodd-Frank will be about, it will not be about in reality. And therefore, it will be effectively repealed. The problem with the debate on Dodd-Frank now is people take broad topics, like there are provisions in Dodd-Frank called consumer protection. And they sound quite sanguine when you say consumer protection. It's just two words. But if you read the consumer protection provisions, you realize it has very little to do with consumer protection, all sorts of things to do with other sorts of interests that will not help anyone. So I hope it becomes a nuanced political debate where politicians actually look at provisions and they put in front of the American public all the bizarre things that are happening in this law and law. I think if people saw those bizarre provisions, then the law would be killed and that would be merciful for not only America but for the world. <laughs>
Yeah, who wants to expand on that? Just to, I mean, great point. I had it highlighted too. I thought that was really interesting. Who wants to expand on that? Um, Zero sum nature. Go ahead. Build it. Next page, but uh, um, I was trying to say maybe the answer is that some firms might not have answered this and all reality should have been. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how he pointed out, you know, bankruptcy is a much more orderly thing than the sky is falling. And when he mentioned the how many bankrupt airlines have you <laughs> written in, I mean, it's, it's, we, can, we can work through it. It's just a way of kind of holding back the creditors and, and doing things in an orderly fashion. So, so yeah, I thought that was, that was interesting, too. You're talking about towards the very end of the chapter? Yeah, at the back. Uh huh. Why, why didn't he just not mail it out? Right. Yeah, and, and, and in not so many words, which counterparty was he most interested in potentially? Which Hank Paulson, Goldman Sachs, yeah. So he was, Allison's not one to uh, not pull out any punches and call, call it as he sees it. So that, that was interesting, yeah. Sure. That? Um, it, it's on the bankruptcy issue. When we were talking about bankruptcy in class, we were talking about you know, firms who continue <coughs> to operate if they're delinquent, but they're still paying for the time, right? Yeah. And, but they wouldn't be able to operate for particular loan if they were insolvent. Is that what they kind of have to shut down? Um, no, if, if they're illiquid, they're not having enough funds to pay their monthly mortgage payment or whatever, right. right? If they're insolvent, it might be a temporary insolvency. So if their asset, if asset prices have plummeted 50%, but they're still able to operate, and hopefully if prices rebound, they might be back to solvent again. So it's just if they had to sell today, they wouldn't be able to cover all their liabilities. So that's how it would be placed into hypothetical state of the law. Yeah. Going through the bank. And that's what the government did with the bailout, essentially, is, is kind of provide them the assurance that, hey, we'll ride this out with you. But if they ultimately went down the tubes, then the taxpayer money goes down the tubes with it. Jason. I have a question. Okay, what's your comments? Okay, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. However, because, of, and I highlighted this too, however, because of their complexity, the role of these instruments has been misunderstood and significantly overestimated. It should be noted that despite its protests, to the contrary, the Fed always had the practical power to control the shadow banking system. Yeah. Okay, and so your comment on that is that, or you like that or didn't like that? Say that again. I thought it seemed pretty accurate that because it's a complex system, nobody really wants to figure out all the ins and outs of the system. Right. Yeah. And as we start to learn the system, getting back to the zero sum comment that you made, is it a bad system? It's complex, I mean, but the the folks on I mean, he goes to talk about the losers at the very end. I yeah. Was about to mention that. And like the folks that are in the university endowments, the pension plans, and the hedge funds, those they might say it's a bad system because they were like, we made all this money and then right. we lost it. But and then right. That's exactly why they lost it is because yep. they took on they took on more than they idea. should have. They were kind of yeah, irresponsible with it, but yet they didn't have to pay the consequences. Yeah. So with that paragraph that she hinted on, um, it says the Fed could have used its almost unlimited. Yeah, so I, I think what he's getting at is that um, 
the portrayal of it is that the shadow banking were lurking in the shadows and that there's this you know system that nobody knows about that, that caused the crisis. I think he's saying here that the Fed knew about it all along. They understand the derivatives and all the stuff that we've learned in class. And if they thought that was a big problem, they could have stepped in and regulated it if so they, they thought it was. So for once, this wasn't a government problem, the shadow banking system. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, yes, kind of. Okay. I, I think the problem that he kind of continually goes back to is the, the uh, bad information that we were getting through, like the rating agencies on the value of it and the problems that caused, as well as the Fed suppressing interest rates to stimulate affordable housing that caused asset prices to be, be beyond their sustainable, you know, where they should be. Um, so what do you mean, that they could have? Like um, at the bottom of the paragraph, yeah. where it says that it says again, the Fed could have used its normal and limited authority to control these institutions in order to control the whole interconnected, interconnected system. system. So I wasn't thinking they were going directly to regulate them or shadow banking. So right. You're saying that's what they could have done. But he's saying well, that's what they could have done. They're making it sound like they were operating in the shadows that the Fed didn't know what was going on, when in reality they did. And furthermore, what they were doing um, kind of makes sense that it's a zero-sum game, that it wouldn't bring down the whole system anyway. I thought uh, um, just before the zero-sum, um, how the market is grossly overestimated in terms of the risk. I thought Allison did a good job. I was hoping you guys from that last chapter we just did kind of got that, that the interest hedge, um, there's a billion dollar would be the notional balance that's being dealt with. And so that's what would be in the media is that we've got a trillion dollar market because one contract might be for $1 billion. But truly the amount at risk is the interest, which turned out to be, you know, using his hypothetical example here, $10 million was really the amount at risk, which was only 1% of the total of market. So it, it kind of lends itself to the media to, to really blow that shadow banking system is way bigger than it actually really is. And then you get into the zero sum effect that it's just somebody on one side changing dollars and hedging risk. So, okay, good. What else? What page you on? Uh, 127. When the financial market began to sort of crash, CDS was kind of misused and misled, real bad, misled in this uh, economic environment. Uh, when the market came so thin, they were using the short stock and stuff. Yeah. To misled other market participants. Yeah. What's, I'm glad you brought up the thin. I wanted to, what's the thin market? What does it mean when the, what did he mean here with the, the market's thin? There were less buyers and sellers. Less buyers and sellers, yeah. So when if the market, it's kind of like going to an auction and there's only 10 people in the room and the auctioneer was hoping there was going to be 200 people, right? The market's thin. You're going to see prices aren't going to be bid up that high. Kind of, We don't get efficient pricing out of the system if the market's too thin. We want that market to be thick with lots of competitors on both sides, both a lot of sellers, a lot of buyers, kind of the heart of, of competition. Right, right, yep. Good. And what else? That part, I was kind of envisioning the housing crisis video that you showed uh -huh. sometimes that um, when it starts freezing up and then it just kind of sinking bombs everywhere because there's less buyers and sellers and now everybody's kind of sucked themselves. Yeah.
people that are supposed to be enforcing it aren't really yeah. enforcing it. Yeah. Yep. And that's kind of the the Tea Party groups, if you've heard that group. They're kind of constitutionalist. So they look back to the founding fathers and they say, you know what, this, this limited government idea, whatever, was was uh, not so bad, and, and maybe they knew what they were doing. So if, if you hear the, and Tea Party gets slammed in the media because there's another group, the more uh, liberal groups will say, the Constitution, that's old news. We live in the modern society now. That What they thought 200 years ago is, is meaningless, and, and we need to you know, take money from those take money from people and give it to other people and, and the government can kind of better steer and make things fair. I mean, it's just generalizations of things that you guys will hear on the radio when you start thinking of conservative versus uh, liberal arguments that, that go on. That's the type of thing that, that's out there. What are our naked shorts? Naked shorts. You know, I saw that and I kind of meant to research that. I, I can't give you a quick answer. Um, I can give you what I, you, not, yeah, that, yeah. And yeah, let's go ahead and uh, do the 13 only. For Monday? Yeah. 13 for Monday. So you said we have the Econ uh, on the 5th? The 5th, yes. So just one week in between then? That. Yes, okay. yep, that one we just did one week. Because it's, it's mostly reading comprehension, and, and we just covered it between. Uh,